Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a live recording of Pod County here at the Newcastle County Government Studios. My name is Kyle Grantham. I am your host, and we are joined today by Dr. Timothy Dowling from the University of Delaware, the Director of Student Health Services, correct? Yes, correct. And we also have County Executive Matt Meyer here. Uh, you know, we, we record this podcast uh, monthly, bringing in influential individuals in Delaware um, to tell us, you know, what, they, what they're doing. And I don't think there's any bigger issue right now that we could be talking about than the coronavirus outbreak, uh, COVID-19. And so, um, you know, County Executive, I think you, this was this was really driven by you. If you'd like to discuss why we're all here today doing this live. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Welcome, uh, Dr. Dowling. Welcome everybody who's who's out there watching us uh, in the listening or watching audience. It, it was really important to me in the last week. Uh, obviously, I, like many of my fellow policymakers here in Delaware and, in fact, across the country, have spent a lot of time talking to epidemiologists, emergency room physicians, doctors, public health experts about what was the best approach to take both for our government organization, our employees, and also for the general public. I thought it was appropriate, especially after talking to Dr. Dowling, to bring him in and have him directly interact with the public. So a lot of the same questions I was asking him are different questions, better questions the general public can ask him uh, directly. So we're going to take a few minutes and and uh, ask him some questions, Kyle and I will, but out there, if you're watching on Facebook Live, please, please enter any questions, concerns, comments, criticisms you have in the comment section below this video, uh, and we'll be happy to have Dr. Dowling uh, entertain them. Excellent, thanks, Matt. Uh, Dr. Dowling, you know, I just real quick wanna, wanna introduce you to everyone, your background a little bit. Um, so can you, can you tell us a little bit about what your um, area of focus is and, and what your uh, role is in your position at, at UD? Sure. I am a family physician by training, uh, and I've been a family physician since 1993 when I moved down to Delaware here. Uh, my current role is medical director for the University of Delaware Student Health Services. I've been in that role for the last seven years. Uh, and we take care of about 24,000 students on the University of Delaware campus. And um, in terms of the, the coronavirus situation that, that we're dealing with now, um, you know, nationwide there have been an, a number of measures that, that have been taken, and I think it's kind of been state by state, the, the reaction that we've seen, um, you know, from initially just, hey, everybody, let's uh, make sure we wash our hands to, okay, we're gonna start full social distancing measures and work from home and stuff like that. What's happening at the University of Delaware right now um, from, from you know, where it was, where did, where did it start there for you guys and where is it at now? Sure, so um, on January 23rd, um, we were anticipating our students coming back and I started seeing information uh, coming across that China was having an outbreak of a, a new type of disease um, that we hadn't seen before. Um, tried to learn as much as I could about it in a short period of time. By January 24th, uh, we had a plan put into place to screen people uh, for this new disease, which was at that time coronavirus. Um, later became known as COVID-19. So COVID-19, uh, we had a plan in place. Uh, we were gearing up because we were having students return from our winter session um, around February 8th or 10th um, that classes would be starting at that time. So we wanted to have everything in place so that we could be prepared in case uh, someone brought that infection back with them from their travels abroad. Um, so in doing that, we were able to actually test it a few times. We had students come back early uh, that had what may have appeared to be symptoms, and you may have seen that in the papers. Uh, we had two students that uh, met the criteria that we got tested, uh, put into quarantine, and actually, thankfully for them and for all of us, they tested negative. Um, so uh, we were hoping that once the students were on campus for 14 days that we were out of the woods at that point. We all took a sigh of relief. Uh, unfortunately, it did make it to the United States shores and has been spreading across, and unfortunately, it did affect some of the people that actually um, are part of the University of Delaware community. I think um, I think one probably good myth to kind of dispel right now. One of the things we talked about is really kind of breaking down some of these things. Um, you know, pe people have said, "Oh, oh, it's 
it's it's no different than the common cold. Coronavirus has caused common cold. It's this is just a seasonal flu. What makes this coronavirus different from from a flu, a seasonal flu, any anything else we've seen before? Okay, so the first thing is is that it's new. It's it's something our immune systems have never seen before. Uh, so that has an impact on our immune system. Uh, it may overreact and make people very sick. Uh, the way this virus gets into our system is very similar to the flu uh, in that it likes to go into our respiratory system, get down into our lungs and produce potentially harmful things. Uh, one is acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, which may mean that that person needs to be on a ventilator and they could die from that. Um, Coronaviruses, we have them. There's four common coronaviruses that humans get that get colds. Usually it's a pretty bad cold uh, that people will get. Um, but this is a virus that came from an animal, jumped to humans. And so when it does that, the, the immune system's not quite sure, and it can be much more virulent than the common cold. Elizabeth Pont asked, please give the criteria, the temperature, and the symptoms at which time a person or senior citizen should do something, how will we be able to be tested if we meet such criteria? So the criteria, the strict criteria by the CDC is a temperature greater than 100.4, a cough, and shortness of breath. So you need those three criteria. Uh, can, can you repeat that? Sure. It's a temperature greater than 100.4, a cough, and shortness of breath, so all three of those criteria. Uh, Christiana Hospital has actually put into place a testing um, area uh, within their campus, so if you meet that criteria, as long as you have a doctor that has written a prescription for testing, you can go to Christiana Hospital and get tested there. Um, for us at the University of Delaware, we actually have uh, the sampling kits to test people and send it to the Department of Health. So we do the swab and then we send it to the Department of Health. Um, and that's because we did have cases here on campus at the University of Delaware. So, so if I have those three symptoms, uh, shortness of breath, a cough, and temperature above 100.4, should I go to the hospital emergency room? No, your first thing that you should do is actually call your physician um, or medical practitioner if it's a nurse practitioner. Um, and let them know your symptoms. They will then direct you to um, either call the Department of Health or tell you exactly how you need to engage in the medical system. People walking into the emergency room with unprotected areas, uh, not having their mouth covered, um, could potentially make other people sick and disperse that, that virus to other people. There have been a relatively small number compared to our population of 565,000 in Newcastle County. There have been a relatively small number of individuals who've tested positive to COVID-19. Does that mean we, by and large, have the, the uh, problem under control and there's a small number this affects? No, I can't say that right now. Um, we, unfortunately, don't have a large number of tests, uh, it, not only in the state of Delaware, but across the country. Uh, so unless you meet criteria, people are not getting tested, uh, which is probably a good thing. We want to save the tests to help us figure out people that are very sick in the hospital what the proper treatment would be. So we want to make sure that they, if they are in the hospital very sick and they have COVID-19, that we've confirmed that with a test and we can prepare for the best treatments to save as many lives as possible. Good, thanks. So. Um, you know, looking again at some of these myths, some of the some of the things that are happening right now in the community, um, I think, and and there's probably a lot of reasons for this, but people aren't really sure what to do. They're not sure if they're going to be told they have to stay home and and lock down no matter what for two weeks or whatever. And we've seen uh, some panic buying. Um, I I, did, I really didn't want to believe that it was happening in Delaware. So all my friends around the country were sharing photos of there's no toilet paper, there's no whatever. And I went out yesterday. Um, to buy a thermometer, and I could, you know, I'm a millennial. I'm never sick, and realized I didn't have a thermometer, right? And I couldn't find. Went to three stores, couldn't find a thermometer. Finally, bought a baby thermometer, which is apparently exactly the same, just as a baby on the package. Nobody thought to do that, but but that was that was the first one I found. But there was no toilet paper at Target, no toilet paper at Acme in Newark. Um, why should people not be buying all the toilet paper in their grocery stores? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I'm not sure why everyone's going out and buy, panic buying toilet paper. 
Um, really, there, if you panic buy a lot of stuff and you hoard stuff, then there won't be uh, those items available for people that actually need it, that may have been working hard all day long, haven't had a chance to get out and buy those important things for us for daily life, and those things are now not available. And then how do we actually cope with that? One of the issues that we ran into is um, for across the country, people running out and buying masks, um, especially the N95 masks. From a medical standpoint, people that are not sick really shouldn't be using them. Um, they have to be fitted appropriately. Um, if you're, you have an underlying problem from a lung standpoint, those masks can actually exacerbate some things and make it difficult for you to breathe. Um, but medical people need these in order to take care of people that are sick. And if we don't have that, that puts care for those people in jeopardy. It puts our physicians, nurses, our first responders in grave jeopardy. And how are we going to be able to protect our community if we don't have these supplies available to us? Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stacy Weil asks, what should I do if I've found out that I've been in the same place as someone who tested positive? So the first thing is not to panic, um, that you should remain calm and find a place um, to, that meets the criteria for proper quarantining. So if you've had close contact with someone that tested positive for COVID-19, um, then the recommendation is, and you have no symptoms, the recommendation is that you self-quarantine for 14 days. Um, Self-quarantine means that you have a room to yourself and you have a bathroom that you and only you use in that house. Um, if you meet those two criteria, then you can safely self-quarantine and protect the people around you and your loved ones within your domicile. Uh, so that's really important that you do that. Uh, do not panic, do not run out and get tested um, until you start having symptoms. And then again, once you start having symptoms, make sure that you contact the Department of Health and your, pro your medical provider to let them know that you have symptoms and they can guide you into how you can safely engage in the medical uh, system. Uh, so I know, Doctor, you don't work for the Division of Public Health, but uh, Sis Carol Logan asked, is the university the only hotspot in Newcastle County? Uh, so we have 10 cases. Um, we, is, at, the at the university, which isn't Delaware. just students, it's staff, faculty. So students, staff, faculty, and people related to, to staff and faculty. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but we have 10 cases. There's 30 cases throughout the state. Uh, so I, I, we have one third of the cases currently. I wouldn't call us the, the epicenter or the hot spot. Um, I'm sure that, that COVID-19 has been in the state from other resources other than the University of Delaware. Yeah, it, it, doctor, there are quote unquote hot spots all over the country. Uh, there are places in the state of New York where the numbers are very high in the state of Washington in the state of California, does that mean that they have high incidences, higher incidences of COVID-19, or does that just mean they tested more? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. Uh, I can honestly say that if they're doing testing and they're finding a lot of cases, um, then, then they're a hot spot. But I'm sure there's other hot spots that people just aren't getting tested because of the lack of availability of the tests. And that creates a problem for everybody to know who's sick and who's not sick. Good. Uh, Jenny Darden asks, if you're not testing everyone, how do you know who the carriers are? That's a great question. Um, so um, it, it's something that, that I think as a medical profession we are struggling with. Um, part of it is, one, encouraging people if you do have symptoms of an upper respiratory, so fever, cough, shortness of breath, that you are staying home. Can there be asymptomatic carriers? I'm sure there are. Um, and that's where social distancing really comes into place. So as much as possible, trying to keep that six feet between people when you're having a conversation, not gathering in large groups. These are all important things to try and help stem the tide, flatten the curve, as you've heard people say, of this virus so that it's not spreading across the country and overwhelming our medical system. Yeah, what I've been telling our 2,095 county employees, much based on y your advice, Dr. Dowling, is that just assume everybody you know is positive. Assume you are positive. That, of course, is not the case, right? But it's an invisible enemy, and the most we can do is just assume and protect everyone.
Yeah, that's, um, you know, when we first uh, were preparing for this and putting out language to the University of Delaware community, one of the things that we really wanted to emphasize was that COVID-19 does not have a face. Uh, just because someone looks Asian doesn't mean that they are a carrier or they're at higher risk to give you COVID-19. Anybody can give you COVID-19 and don't base it on how someone looks or acts. I think you now have to say it doesn't look Asian or Italian, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's been one uh, issue that I think has, has unfortunately come up is the, the some officials have started to try and label it the China virus. Uh, similar to how we had the Spanish flu 100 years ago, although the Spanish flu had nothing to do with Spain. There was censoring at the time. The government actively tried to suppress that story, and so the only way you could write about it was to write about what was happening in Spain, and so people identified it as the Spanish flu. So it, it, there, there was the Spanish flu actually was first discovered in Kansas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, this, this doesn't have an identity as to where it may the first case have been detected or, or um, you know, where it may have come from. You know, this originated, we believe, right now in bats. Um, so it's not, um, yeah, it's not specific to, to an individual. It's really, I think it's really dangerous to try and paint it, you know, to a, a race or a nationality or anything like that. This, this, like you said, it has no face. Um, this is affecting everyone, no matter who you are. I agree 100%. Yeah. We're, sure. we're getting a lot of questions about the economy, about the shutting of businesses, uh, the economic impact of shutting businesses. Why don't we shut down the s state is what uh, Teresa Gravett Barry said. Do you have, I know it's not sort of, you know, you're helping patients to stay alive every day, but do you have any thoughts on what we should or should not be doing? Well, I, I think from an economic standpoint, that's always a difficult decision. Um, every decision that we made at the University of Delaware started with the health and safety of the community. And if you start with the health and safety of the community, I don't think you can make a wrong decision um, as long as you are being transparent in that thought process. Um, so I would encourage um, our leaders uh, including yourself. Uh, one, by having this podcast, I think is great, but also as you make these important decisions explaining why we're making those. Again, we have a delicate medical system, um, and if you overwhelm that, there will be thousands of people that will die because we overwhelm the medical system. Not only from COVID-19, but someone could have a heart attack and the beds aren't available, or someone with uh, COPD, which is emphysema or lung disease, couldn't have a ventilator because we overwhelmed the system. So there's ramifications greatly um, that we need to take into, into consideration as we're making these decisions. And yes, I know it's hard. My wife owns a bookstore. Um, she had to make hard decisions about her staff and, and how to run that bookstore to keep everyone in the community safe. So I, I've been through that decision-making process both in the university and personally with my, my family. My mom and dad are, uh, are both over 80. They've been pretty much at home in the house for the past 11 days. I know there are quite a few people out there with that same situation, either a parent, a grandparent, or maybe even uh, someone watching tonight who's been inside for over a week. What message do you have for them? So um, try to visit and communicate with your, your parents. I have, I'm in the same situation, so I call them each day on the way home uh, so that I can connect with them, make sure they're okay. If I do go and visit them, I, I make sure that I am socially distancing myself from them and try to touch as little as possible in the house and tell them to clean after I leave. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a little frightening um, to think that you could potentially bring something home to a family member that causes them to get sick and, and potentially die from it. Can they go outside? Sure, I, I mean, I, I, as long as they're socially distancing and not getting in a large a crowd, um, they could go for a walk in their community. I don't think that's a problem. They could say hi to their friends. I'm recommending instead of even rubbing elbows, just waving, because you can even stay further socially distanced than, than actually touching elbow to elbow. That still, I think, brings you too close. Um, so I try to avoid even that with people. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to go back and talk about that overwhelming the medical system thing because that's the that's really the reason we're doing all this social distancing. We, we talk about flattening the curve, and mm -hmm. and I think most people have probably seen the two graphs by now, with the one with the big spike and and you know and then the the big longer one. And so we may be looking at a longer period of disruption, but it it means more people will survive because the hospital system doesn't get overwhelmed. Can you talk a little bit about? Uh, what that looks like and what we're kind of seeing right now, because I know we're, we're starting to hit, 
a, an almost overwhelming point, at least in terms of medical supplies on a lot of fronts. Yes. So um, I, I actually have heard from the state um, asking that we make inventories of the supplies that we have for personal protective equipment. You may hear that referred to as PPE. Um, so we are trying to be as judicious as possible um, for when and if we get this big surge, if it does happen, that we can protect our medical community and our first responders so that we can give care to the patients. Um, but with everyone running out and buying that, uh, those, especially those N95 masks, it does put people at jeopardy and it's low supply. I know that they've added the WARS Act to try and increase the numbers um, of masks being made and distributed and hopefully that will move quickly. I think the Pentagon today announced that they are releasing 1 million N95 masks uh, to the community, so hopefully we'll be able to see that and help protect our first responders and medical professionals. Great. Uh, other than older folks, who, who are some of the, I've heard immunocompromised tossed around. What, what does that mean? Who are other groups that we should be particularly concerned about? So that's a great question. So for elderly, um, and I'm getting closer to the, the older group, um, so anybody over the age of 60, and it goes up exponentially, so 60 to 70, 70 to 80, and if you get over 80, um, the, the death rate there is much higher than someone, say, in their 20s. And I think you, you also mentioned to me, correct me if this is wrong, uh, you mentioned to me the other day that there had been no fatal cases. I hope it's still true as of today. There, there have been no documented fatal cases, zero to nine. Right. Among 10 to 19-year-olds, there was a very small number. Mm -hmm. And each decade, 20 to 29, the number increased. 30 to 39, the number increased. 40 to 49, the number increased. 50 to 59, the number increased. And then I believe you said, going from the 50s to the 60s is a dramatic increase. There's dramatically higher risk. Yes, the risk does go up uh, the older we get. Um, so one of the interesting things is um, uh, Anthony Fauci brought up yesterday uh, that millennials... And who, who's Anthony Fauci? Anthony Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and in, um, Infectious Diseases, has been in that role as director since 1984, uh, has been under all different presidents since that time, both Republican and Democrat. This is not a political appointment. Um, uh, from my understanding, he's well respected. And in, he's taking the front and, and is really, for me, the voice of reason um, in that arena uh, to help us figure out what is the right information from a public standpoint. And so what he said yesterday was that the millennials have an obligation to, per, to, to distance themselves, do this social distancing, not because they may be at more risk for getting the disease, but they may bring it back to their families and older people and continue to be the people that would spread it within the community. Um, and, and a lot of people have talked that they may have less symptoms um, and they may be asymptomatic carriers because their, their immune systems are stronger and they may not um, have as much difficulty with it. But we are starting to see reports out of Italy and France that that age group is actually getting sicker than what our initial reports from China were. Um, so that may change the table, and it may be something that, as we see it growing in the United States, that we start seeing uh, the millennials actually having trouble with it. And that's, that's heartfelt. Uh, that would be terrible if they're getting sick. I don't want anyone to get sick. Um, but especially if you're, you're not practicing social distancing and you're bringing this home to someone that you care about and they get sick, I think that would be a terrible feeling for anybody. So not to, not to continue along this de sure. depressing line, but how concerned should we be about the virus mutating or getting more aggressive or getting smarter in an in a, in a obviously negative way? We haven't seen that yet, that it's mutated. Obviously, here in the United States now that we have um, sort of our people and the CDC having more data um, that we may be able to see it and trace it a little better. I'm, I'm hoping if it mutates, it mutates to a less severe form. That would be nice. One of the things I just wanted to get back to you had asked about uh, people that are immune compromised, and we got off the subject, mm -hmm. didn't get to that. So people with diabetes, uh, especially if it's not well controlled, they, their immune systems are weaker. People that may have um, an autoimmune problem uh, like Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis, their immune systems may be suppressed mostly because of the medications that they're on. Um, uh, people that have had cancer treatment recently may have suppressed their immune systems. So those are other people that we would definitely be concerned about. So just so I understand cr clearly, doctor, you're saying 
for, for older folks, generally over 60, and as you get more and more over 60, it becomes more of an issue, you generally should be sheltered at home, go out for a walk, have people help you to get groceries, friends, neighbors, family. You're saying uh, those who have diabetes, who have Crohn's disease, who have cancer and other immunodeficiencies should should have the same precautions. Absolutely. They should practice those, the same social Even distancing. if they're a teenager, even if they're in their 20s? Yes, no matter what their age is. And, and if you have an underlying lung disease like um, COPD, emphysema, asthma, if you have heart disease, um, those would be things that this virus, if you get it, could stress the system enough that it could uh, end your life. And we don't want to see that. What are some of the things you see happening in our community that you think is, is good, where you say, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm glad we're doing this. This is going to save lives. So um, what we're seeing, is, especially on our campus at the University of Delaware, is um, most of our employees are working from home. Every meeting I've been in this week has been a, um, an online meeting, whether it's Zoom, Skype, telephone conference call. Um, so we're really trying to, as much as possible, not have people gather into a room together. I would say the same thing from a uh, community standpoint is to try to avoid gathering, and, and I think the state has already said gathering in groups larger than 10. I would try to avoid that as much as possible, any gathering of people. Uh, one one question that we've seen is well, why aren't we mass testing? Why aren't we just testing everybody? They've done that other places. Why not more testing? So uh, as I've said before, um, we unfortunately in the United States have limited number of tests. And so for, for the physicians and the healthcare professionals to make critical decisions and know what they're taking care of in those critically ill people in the hospital, we need to have those tests readily available for us. And if we test everybody and we run out of tests, it may make it difficult for that person that we are anticipating may take a bad course. We don't know if they have COVID-19 or not. Um, we need to know that information so that we can be prepared for their downward spiral if that does happen. Uh, there have been a lot of, I guess, uh, bogus home remedies and things that have, have, you know, social media breeds craziness. I've seen everything from if you drink water every 15 minutes, you'll be fine. You can't get it if you you know, uh, oh, you just got to eat a lot of oranges and get your vitamin C up or garlic. Or, what should people really be doing to help themselves and what isn't really going to help them? Okay, so things that really help, social distancing, washing your hands, not touching your face, practicing good cough and sneeze hygiene where you sneeze and cough into your, your elbow. Those are all important things to do. Um, unfortunately, drinking water every 15 minutes will not do anything. It doesn't wash the acid, the, the virus down into your stomach and the acid in your stomach will kill it. The virus attaches to the cells in the back of your throat, in your nasal pharynx, which is your nose, um, and it, it then gets into the cells there where it reproduces and then you shed virus out through your sputum. When you're talking, when you're coughing, when you're sneezing, it leaves your body. Um, so that won't help drinking water every 15 minutes. Um, the drinking lots of orange juice, hey, if it makes you feel good, that's, that's great. It's not going to help you fight the, the coronavirus and keep you from getting the COVID-19. Um, if you eat garlic, uh, the nice thing about that, it may help strengthen your immune system, um, but it definitely will help with social distancing. If you eat raw garlic, people won't want to come next to you. Uh, so that will improve the social distancing. So that's how I think garlic may actually help us. And uh, somebody asked in, in the comments, and this is probably good, we may have kind of skipped over this, but what, what are the symptoms of COVID-19 and how would one know that their symptoms might be different from something like the flu or the common cold? So um, common cold, you tend not to run a fever with the common cold. You'll have runny nose, you may get a cough, you may have watery eyes, um, but the flu and COVID-19 are very close in symptoms. Fever, shortness of breath, runny nose, cough, sore throat, body aches, those are all things that we see both in both of those. That's why we encourage people at the very beginning and every year should be encouraged to get the flu shot. It helps us, one, differentiate. Did you get the flu shot this year? Did you not? Okay, so could this be the flu? 
And so before we test anybody for COVID-19, we usually are testing them for the flu and seeing if the rapid flu test comes back negative. If it does, that raises our chances that this could be COVID-19. We'll do strep throat testing, and so that's another rapid test that doctors can do in their office. And if that comes back negative, then again, it helps elevate that pre-testing probability that this could be COVID-19 and helps us make that decision that this is an important test to do on this person. Dr. Dowling, Patricia Anderson asks, she says, hi, I read an article online that gastrointestinal issues such as diarrhea are also a symptom of one strand of COVID-19. Is that true? So yes, there are some reports that people will have nausea, some vomiting and diarrhea, um, but it's not the predominant symptoms that we're seeing. And, and we just want to clarify on runny nose and, and phlegm, COVID-19 symptom or no? So that could be this time of year, seasonal allergies. It could be a cold. It could be the flu. It could be COVID-19. COVID-19, the things to remember and the big part of this is fever and then also cough and shortness of breath. Those are the, the three most important symptoms that help us think that this could be COVID-19. Fever is critical yes. overall. How, how long do you think we're in this for? Are we uh, on Friday, next Friday night? Can we go out, restaurants will be open again? Are we in this for a month? Is it six months? Is it 18 months? What are we looking at? So I've heard all of those. Um, 18 months uh, may be um, a very high number. Uh, I, I, I think we're looking at somewhere between eight to 20 weeks, um, and, and that's to be conservative. I don't want to overpromise anything, um, but I, I, we're looking at this going through the summer for sure. So, so you mentioned summer. I've heard that heat, I've, I've been told by people who are not terribly reliable, but I've been told that, that heat kills the, the virus. Is that accurate? No, that's unfortunately, well, so if you take the virus itself and put it on a piece of, of, of a Petri dish and expose it to high temperatures, yes, the virus will die. Um, but if heat in the atmosphere was something that would kill the virus, we wouldn't be seeing this spread in South America and in Australia where it's summer now for them. They're in their summer and it's spreading down there. So um, I don't expect that once we transition to spring and then into summer, um, if this virus is still multiplying in the atmosphere and within our communities, it's still gonna be here. As long as we have people that are transmitting it from one person to the next, the virus isn't gonna die. It replicates in humans. It doesn't replicate outside of humans. So turning the thermostat up to 100 and opening all the schools and libraries is not an option? No, that's not going to work. Okay. As, as we look at, um, uh, you know, we talked about people being asymptomatic. Um, and then we, as we look at what just happened in Florida, and you kind of had this mass rejection of all these millennials. Well, they're not millennials. They're Gen Z mm -hmm. uh, individuals. As a millennial, I take offense to the behavior. Uh, just saying, forget it, it's spring break, I'm going out and this is what I'm going to do. What kind of risk, you know, we've talked about the cases could be worse now from what we're seeing out of Italy, or could they be putting themselves at, but also could they be putting their, their family at, because a lot of their universities have closed and they're going to go back home now. Right, that's, that's a major concern, and, and it's unfortunate. I think at any time, people are not going to be trusting of the information that's coming out. Um, and they're going to do what they want to do. And, and as Americans, we have the right to do that. Um, but there are consequences sometimes to our actions. And in this case, these consequences could be potentially deadly for people that we care about. Minor, minor switching issue there. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about the N95 masks. We've talked about, you know, let's not hoard all the toilet paper. You mentioned PPEs, and I've been seeing some, some of that. Uh, more and more hospitals are running out of those. I mean, I guess that's not really something that we as the general public can, you know, I'm not going out and buying up all the PPEs. That's something, something, something you can get to. But are you aware of steps that are being taken to make sure that we're being stocked and, and, and that our hospitals and our, our care providers are being, um, you know, getting the things that they need from a federal or state level? So I can at least comment for the state of Delaware. Um, I've been in contact with um, the, the people for the Department of Health, um, as well as emergency management, and uh, they have um, told me that they do have stock of personal protective equipment, 
uh, face shields, gowns, gloves, um, the N95 masks. These are all vital things. Um, they've asked us to do an inventory of what we have. Um, so if push comes to shove, that we get it to the people that need it the most. And, and again, it's our medical professionals. It is our first responders. These are the people that we care about, um, that we want to make sure that we have plenty of protection for them so that they can give good care to our citizens of the state of Delaware. Great. Uh, thank you. Doctor, do you th do, this is from Patience Marie. Uh, she commented on Facebook. Do you feel Delaware is doing what is needed to flatten the curve? I, I think they are. Um, they, they, can we do more? We always can. Um, I think it really falls on the citizens of the state to take it into their own hands and say, we are going to do the best thing we can to protect our fellow citizens. It's nice to have leadership reinforce that, but it really falls on each individual to say, I'm going to do what I have to do for, for this outbreak and this pandemic and make sure that we are doing the best thing for our, our state, our, our community, our, our fellow family members uh, to protect all of us. What, what news sources or information do you use to get daily updates on what's going on with COVID-19? Um, so uh, the 24-hour news networks are definitely not a source uh, for me. Uh, John Hopkins has a wonderful website um, that keeps me up to date with statistics. Um, and the New England Journal of Medicine is another place that uh, is a great resource for us. Um, there is a online community of infectious disease specialists called ProMed um, that I get feeds from on a daily basis um, that keeps me up to date with any infectious disease around the globe, both for humans and for animals. So um, it's, it's a great feed and it's a wonderful read for me. Uh, someone asked in the comments, and, and I already know the answer to this because I've been following the story today, but the president said that chloroquine has been found to be effective. The FDA came out within 20 minutes and said that's not accurate. We've just yeah. started testing to see if it would be effective. What, but what do you know of that we've identified anything, or if, if we've identified anything that has been effective in, in treatment? So um, nothing has been identified as definitive as treatment. We're using different antiviral medications. Uh, China had done a study looking at uh, two old HIV medications. It's not looking like it's panning out. Uh, the chloroquine story is also coming out from China. Um, so I'm not sure if that's going to be reliable information. Um, it's a very cheap medicine, so I think people want to hang their hats on there. My fear is now everyone's going to start um, pricing that up, unfortunately, hopefully not. Um, but uh, to jump on some bandwagon without having good studies behind it uh, is premature. And, you know, you, this may be, I guess, probably maybe out of your range at UD, but what, um, what, is, the, what is the prognosis right now for UD? I guess is classes are suspended or is cla class kind of done for the year or what, is there a plan to come back? Do you know what, what's happening there? So um, us, like uh, many other universities, uh, what we've done is we extended spring break uh, to include two weeks. That's allowing our faculty uh, to actually upload um, classes online. Uh, so we'll be conducting classes online until we feel it is safe from the uh, uh, United States and a global standpoint, because we have students coming from all around the world, um, for everyone to return to the University of Delaware community. We want that to happen as fast as possible. Um, but we also want to be safe in doing that decision making. Uh, so obviously we don't want to bring people back before uh, we know that they're going to be safe coming back to the University of Delaware. What do you, Dr. Dowling, what do you say to 20-year-olds, 20 20-somethings, 20 who uh, look at the data and say this doesn't really affect me much more than the flu? Why are you closing my restaurants, bars? Why are you not enabling me to go out and play basketball? So although it may only affect you minimally, I can't predict that the person next to you will be minimally affected. Whether that person may have an underlying illness that, that might affect their immune system, they may be on medications that may affect their immune system. So if I had two 25-year-old people in the bar sitting next to each other and drinking and one person has a mild case of COVID-19 and they give it to that person next to them, and they have some other problem, their immune system may not handle it and that person could die. 
Um, so, or they may have an immune system that can handle it and they'll just get a mild case, but they could bring it home to their grandparent or to a sibling that is, has an immune system problem or to a parent and make them very ill. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm looking at this as something where we all need to take personal responsibility to care for our community and the people that we, we love. Um, and we need to make sure that we're doing that the best way we can. Thank you. I know um, someone asked in the comments, that like, so no fever, no COVID-19. It, it's important to note, though, that you could still be asymptomatic and not have a fever. Yes, there are potential for people to be asymptomatic carriers. There's definitely potential for people to not have all the symptoms. Um, so these are the hard and fast symptoms that we're using, that fever, that cough, that shortness of breath, to try and use the tests that we have judiciously. Um, so I would, as I've heard in this room already, just assume everyone has COVID-19 and protect yourself the best way possible. Um, but um, make sure that we are having some human interaction. It's nice to see a face and to smile at each other, um, but you don't have to give a hug. You don't have to be close to each other. Um, you know, it's, it's just being using common sense to help protect everybody. Emily Van Vlack wrote, can't ride in a taxi if sick, or she has disabilities. Uh, she can't ride in a taxi if sick. People are coughing on paratransit. Ambulances may get swamped. I think Lyft and Uber are not running. drive through food bank and drive through testing require a car. It's good to account for folks with disabilities like myself. Her question is, if someone lives alone, is handicapped and cannot drive, is there any advice to give one dealing with COVID-19? So um, I'll, I'll give two advices. The first one is for people before they get COVID-19. So ideally for people, they should have a plan what if this enters my community, which it has? So what do I do? Do you know your neighbors? Do you have someone that you can rely on um, that can do your shopping for you and leave groceries outside your door? Can they get things for you that you need, your medications? Can they go to the, the, to the pharmacy and pick that up? Um, so having those plans in place is very important before people start getting sick around you. Once you're, you have a bunch of people that are sick and you're worried that you may have COVID-19, this is where you can use our Department of Health and contact them and explain your situation, that you have the symptoms, you're worried about having COVID-19, that you may have a disability that you can't get out of your house, or you may have underlying conditions that make you more susceptible to having a bad outcome from COVID-19. They may, and I'm talking now, I am not part of the Department of Health, so, um, but they may take that into consideration and try and figure out the best way to contact you and engage you in the healthcare system without getting you out of your house. And Ms. Van Vleck, if you, are, uh, if you are in a situation where the answer to all those questions is no, you have no neighbor to help you, you have no family member to help you, you truly have nowhere to go, do not hesitate to send me a message on Facebook, Matthew Meyer, and we will do whatever we can, whatever resources we can bring to bear to help you out. Uh, we I do want to acknowledge we're getting a lot of questions around when our school is going to open back up. Um, you know what? What are and a lot of these are geared towards the state. We, the county does not control schools. We don't control the school districts. Um, so those are great questions for for the state and and state leaders. Um, Governor Carney has been hosting press conferences daily with. Um, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long and our, our leaders at the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, I, I would highly recommend tuning in to the state pages, Department of Health and Human Services Facebook page, Governor Carney's Facebook page. Um, they have been providing pretty regularly um, every day, most I think mostly in the morning, um, a, a similar to this, but usually outside at a normal press conference where the media attends. And, and I would also say, you know, follow your local media um, pages WDEL and the News Journal, ABC, CBS, and you know, all the all the local guys um, who are who are reporting on this stuff daily. Um, I wish we had more info to give people on those, but that's just not our realm of control or influence, and we can't we can't we don't set those policies. Um, Matt, did you have any more questions that you saw coming through? No. No. Doctor Dowling, do you have any other information you'd like to provide that you don't think we've maybe hit on yet? I, I think we covered a lot of the most important stuff. Um, you know, this is great that we can get this message out. I appreciate the invite. 
Um, and, and I just recommend and, and want to implore our politicians and our leaders in our state to really make decisions on the health and safety. That's where you should start all your decisions. And if that's where you're rooting all your decisions, no matter what the decision is, you're going to get blowback. But if you root it in that, you're making the right decision. And so that helps. It helped us at the University of Des uh, Delaware to make those hard decisions. Um, and so I, I want everyone else to work on that, that basis, and that would be great. You know, I've learned in one week of doing this that what today looks like overreacting next week probably looks like we're not doing enough. So we need to keep doing more. I would rather overreact than underreact. And my message to everyone watching tonight is that just that we're all in this together. There are people, whether it's, you know, a waiter or waitress at, at a restaurant, uh, someone older, someone who's young, who has some immunodeficiency, maybe has gone through radiation treatment recently for cancer. People are struggling, and we need to look out for each other now more than ever. We're going to get through this. As, as Dr. Dowling said, we believe, we, we hope it's only a matter of a few weeks or maybe a, a few months, but let's work through it as a community. It's an opportunity for us to show how great we are. So thank you, Kyle and Dr. Dowling for, uh, for putting this together. And I think it's a great opportunity for people to interact. We'll look to do more like this. Yeah, I want to thank everybody who tuned in. I think we, we peaked. We had 330 people on our stream at, at one point in time. So that's fantastic that um, we've had that many people who are able to come in, ask questions. I really want to thank Dr. Dowling for, for your time. I know this is not, not exactly a time when you have a lot of extra time to spare. Um, and, and you've made time for us, so this has been fantastic. And I agree with you. I think this is, you know, something we're going to look to keep doing is we can bring more leaders in to, um, you know, ask these questions, you know, where we don't have answers. We'll try to get the people that do have answers in, and, um, and we'll look to keep trying to inform the public. So if nobody, uh, nobody has anything else to add, we'll, we'll sign off. Thank you, guys. Thank you.